the title of this morning's topic really is to help startup businesses look at tips, tricks, what to do, what not to do, what the market opportunity is, and specifically how to get going in Wales. Uh, so this is an ideal opportunity to quiz this panel, who've all done it for real. Uh, I'm going to let them introduce themselves, and I'll start with, uh, with the chairman, David Warrender. Morning. Uh, David Warrender from Welsh Government. Uh, I've been responsible for uh, the, the digital uh, agenda. Uh, about to take on a new role running uh, a company that we've just set up, an agency called Innovation Point. Uh, so its goal will be to work with uh, small and large businesses, uh, help them through the challenges of innovation, uh, and in part to try and help them access some of that funding that we know that exists uh, out there in UK and uh, Europe and further afield. Use the mic, yeah. Hello. Hi, everyone. Um, David Howell from Central Technology Belt. Um, I must admit my um, innovation environment has been the shed on the side of my house. Um, I'm there on my own at the moment, but um, in the past, I think at the high point, I had sort of three coders, um, a pile of signal processing kit, uh, I think an experimental rig, a um, couple of sales guys who used to come in and out. So it was very good for communication, uh, but there was not a lot of elbow room. Uh, it was great when we moved out. We uh, um, rented the floor of uh, the local manor house, which was uh, great. More elbow room, but um, being so close, it was uh, great and really uh, good for sharing ideas. Uh, my, my day job now is technical director of the Central Technology Belt. Um, that was set up in, the, uh, in around 2000. Uh, I run uh, an open innovation service now, a couple of European projects, um, and we have a wide um, client base around uh, the world from very large, mainly engineering companies, down to one-man bands. And we provide open uh, innovation services, uh, identifying, supporting, and connecting innovators. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Gareth Jones. I'm the founder of uh, a space called Welsh Ice, which is in Caerphilly, on Caerphilly Business Park. Uh, we are coming up to our third birthday, actually, which is um, scary and exciting. But we've created a space which is now over 20,000 square foot, uh, supporting over 80 businesses uh, across a wide range of sectors. Uh, and we've helped create over 250 jobs in the last three years, which is, which is great for an area where there's... Uh, um, it, the brand hasn't really been synonymous with innovation and uh, entrepreneurship. So I think that's starting to change now as part of the Cardiff Capital region, um, which is quite exciting. And we're looking a lot more in the future at how we can uh, share some of what works with, uh, with a lot of people who are really getting quite excited about embedding a lot of the innovation activity within their organizations. <coughs> Morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Paul Harwood, and I am co-founder and director of TechHub in Swansea. Um, we started TechHub about uh, 18 months ago uh, when a group of us got together in uh, one of the other co-working spaces called IndieCube. Um, got so, got a, a few no's from TechHub when we asked them to set one up in Swansea, and eventually they said yes, and we, um, we've gone on to uh, fill a whole building which used to be full of post office workers. Um, with 40 startups, um, about 120 people in the building. Um, like you, we've managed to create a few jobs along the way. Um, and yeah, we, we, we're really pleased with the, the success that we've had. <coughs> I mean, build, uh, building a, a, a community um, in a place like Swansea um, seemed like a bit of a weird idea, like a tech community, especially when there wasn't much of an ecosystem when, when we turned up there. But uh, it's been really cool. It's been an absolutely fabulous success. Is, does anyone know Tech Hub? Anyone know of Tech Hub? Yeah. Um, well, we've a bit, bit about Tech Hub, I and mean, we've got um, Tech Hubs all over the world. We've got uh, Tech Hubs in Berlin, Bangalore, Riga, um, Bucharest. Uh, we've now just opened one in Madrid, which is pretty cool. Uh, we've got two in two locations in Shoreditch in uh, in London and uh, obviously Swansea, which is really cool. Uh, and yeah, we, we, we've, done, we've done really well. Well, the community itself has done really well to bed itself in. 
Um, we've got some incredible startups. Um, my co-founder was talking here yesterday. Um, he's just finished his, uh, I think his third round of funding where he's completed about a million pounds worth of funding. And I've seen that business grow from two people around a desk to now about 40 people in the business in, in, in the space of time that we've been running Tech Hub. Um, a bit about me, I mean, I've, I've been an entrepreneur, uh, successful and unsuccessful for about 20 years. I've had uh, uh, lots of failures and uh, I've wasted lots of money uh, and I've had some successes and luckily I'm, I'm still eating and walking around at the moment. So, <coughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, thanks very much, Paul. So, um, today's session is really about the um, emergence of co-working spaces, the opportunities that that presents for uh, collaboration, uh, and I guess it's just a chance to explore the different you know, merits uh, and different offers of the different facilities available. Um, uh, th this is not a kind of exhaustive list uh, uh, on stage of all of those kind of facilities in Wales, but it's certainly representative. Um, IndyCube weren't able to join us today. I see Geraint there from Springboard, uh, which is another one of the facilities in the audience. So um, hopefully we can have some interesting uh, debate. Uh, I'm going to explore a number of areas, uh, and then I will open it up to the floor for questions as well. Uh, as we get kind of halfway through the session. So um, I suppose uh, if, if, I, if I were a, 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 uh, a potential punter for you guys, you know, I was coming along looking for some space, some facilities, you know, I just wanted to kind of set my business up. Um, I'm, I'm interested in, if I came to each of you, what, what I might get, you know, what, what, what the sales pitch is. So, uh, so you've got one minute of my time. Uh, so maybe Paul, start first. What uh, what would I get? Pool, table tennis, um, and lots and lots of free coffee. No, no. I, we, we've got um, uh, two offerings, which is a flexi uh, member offering, which where you pay four hundred pounds a year, and that gives you two days a week in the space. Um, and we have a, a, a desk-based offering where you pay one hundred and fifty pounds a month, okay. um, and that gets gets you your desk. 24-7 basically you can use that come and go you get a key fob you can come in and use the space um, the most valuable asset you get is actually access to the community itself because within the community we've got um, an you know, incredible amount of uh, incredible wealth of, uh, of expertise and talent and um, it's very nepotistic people tend to hire um, each other and uh, it also transpires that uh, if you're looking for work, I mean, it's a fantastic place to go, you know, because you can, you can, you can honestly have the longest interview you'll probably ever have with someone set, sitting opposite you. <laughs> um, and re really, it's, it, it, you know, it is so infectious. Um, being an entrepreneur there, it can be quite dangerous because you can end up, you can walk in there without any businesses and walk out with three or four under your belt by the end of the day, you know. So, okay. so it's, it's a really vibrant, really brilliant atmosphere. Okay, great. Thank you. No one is. Um, we've got a number of membership options, but the difference, I suppose, we've got the, the desk options, as Paul mentioned, but we've got space for businesses to grow into as well. So um, our idea isn't necessarily about spinning them out after 12 months or 18 months. It's about keeping them in the community as the mentors and role models for the future. Um, we are about to announce, uh, actually, that we're able to offer 50 funded places. Um, to incoming members. So we have uh, a partnership with a number of organizations, um, private philanthropists, private trusts, uh, Welsh government, uh, who are essentially able to offer funding for 12 months for people to get started. Uh, and what we found actually is getting people into that space, into that community, it's the exact, I don't want to kind of repeat everything Paul said, but the, 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 the pool and the table tennis, it might sound deaf, but it's actually what builds the community and it, it builds those relationships. Uh, and the most valuable thing, doesn't matter how many lawyers we get in to hold workshops and seminars and surgeries, the best advice normally comes from someone who's been through 
through it uh, and who can uh, give advice with, with a lot of empathy and a lot of understanding of why that, that person is fearful of asking for the help and support. Um, so, that, so access to that community is a huge part of what we what we offer. Uh, and then, you know, fiber optic broadband, um, stacks of parking, we've got a restaurant space, we've got a crash on site, we've got a boardroom and training room, you know, all the, the facilities, phone answering. Um, but we're dealing with a lot of businesses that have never been in the market for commercial space before and don't actually realize how valuable that is until uh, they try to deal with BT. I hope sorry if there's anyone from BT in the room. Um, but uh, yeah, trying to get your broadband back on when you've uh, uh, had an unexpected outage is uh, pretty frustrating, uh, which is why I'm uh, looking a lot older than I really am. <laughs> All right. Uh, David? Well, I suppose um, what, I, what I can do is uh, talk to you about what's available in the part of the world uh, that we're based, which is uh, Worcestershire. Uh, we have uh, one of the biggest um, conglomerations of uh, cyber technology companies with Kinetic, uh, GCHQ, um, and a whole range of spin-outs uh, centered in, some are in uh, uh, leafy houses out in the country, Other are, others are based at the Malden Hill Science Park. So what we can offer you there is potential clients. Um, it's all very well having uh, uh, great support facilities, and we do have those with, um, ourselves offering the open innovation services and access to funding through European funds. Uh, we also have Worcester Council, who is very keen to promote this area. So the main thing uh, we can offer you there is access to that network in the cybersecurity vein, if any of you are involved in that. Uh, we all, people do other things, obviously, but um, in particular, I think with this audience, uh, that may well be um, of interest to you, and I'd welcome uh, some chat later if, you, if you'd like to take that up. Okay, thank you. And um, so, so interesting, so there's a couple of messages there about, uh, you know, introductions to customers and, and a kind of channel. A lot of messages about the community of interest and being able to kind of learn uh, and share and so on. Uh, do you guys look into the international market to see what's being provided in this, this kind of area? And, and is, there a, is there a sort of perfect model out there that, uh, that you are trying to get to? Well, um, uh, sorry. <laughs> uh, at uh, Tech Hub, we have uh, a great partnership with Google Campus. Uh, they are the kind of model that everybody, all communities, uh, well, not, not base themselves on, but they, because Google just have so much money, uh, they can throw yeah. anything they want together, you know, and um, throw a load of money at it, and it's, you know, it's it's always usually awesome. So, yeah. um, like for example, with the, the Madrid campus that they've just set up, I mean that's that's a, a Google campus um, and Tech Hub space. So, um, yeah, I mean we we draw off all the experience of all the other sites around the world yeah. in order to inform us as to what best practice is and things like that. Yeah. Um, can, we, you, can you describe at all what, what are the attributes of that best practice? So, if if, if the money was available, what would you what would you set up and offer? Uh, more table tennis, <laughs> more pool, uh, maybe a swimming a pool, um, spa. Uh, no, no. Uh, <laughs> probably. Um, I mean, there are certain ingredients to to making a really good co working space, like. like you're saying, um, you know, good social events, um, yeah. things that, it, it, it's all about fun. I mean, uh, that's what brings people together, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. You know, that's what makes us yeah. uh, enjoy what we do. Um, and it's all about getting a space where you can enjoy, actually yeah. enjoy going there. Yeah. Um, part of the, the problem for, I suppose, uh, not the problem really, but with a lot of the kind of business parks and things like that and, and these very staid places they're very yeah. can be very dour places and yeah. really when when you're um doing probably the riskiest thing you'll ever do in your life in terms of business yeah. you really want to have fun because otherwise yeah. you'd probably jump off a building you yeah. know yeah. um 
and that's that's what it comes down to is is, is creating a, an in, you know a really good environment yeah. for, that allows people to take risks and have fun at the same time. Okay. So so uh, a lot of what you described there is about the social side. Didn't actually sound expensive, even though you said actually you know these places have a lot of money. Uh, Gareth, what about you in terms of um, you know the, the 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 perfect model? Where are you trying to get to? We, one of the things that we've realized is that we don't necessarily want to reflect anyone else's model in what we do um, mm -hmm. because our market is a, is a completely different market to yeah. a lot of other centers. So there's actually um, there's a conference for everything now. There's a co-working conference um, called Co-working EU. Um, and it, I was quite staggered when I went along that it was almost like as if we'd all been uh, abducted about five years ago and brainwashed into using the same language without realizing it was all about space. It wasn't about... It wasn't about you know the yield on the on the on the, the shared offices. It, it wasn't about the property play. It was about creating a space where people really wanted to spend time, uh, and the more time that you can spend there, obviously, the more relationships, more um, serendipitous collisions you can have. Um, the more likely you, you are to, to fund partnerships that hopefully will lead to either trade um, or, or support or development of your project. Mm. Um, the, one of the points I think about about if you had a you know the, the the blank check what that would go into i think it's um it's teams you know this is this is quite a low margin yeah. industry to be in yeah. um unless you're taking equity in businesses and one uh, that's one model that works quite well if you've got quite a nice uh, yeah. starting point in terms of being able to invest in the businesses we don't really think that's uh, a model that fits with the, the kind of businesses we're attracting um we're attracting a lot of traditional smes uh, a lot of traditional yeah. freelancers and, and businesses that you know, they're, they're feeding their kids and they're paying their mortgage. Um, they shouldn't be made to feel bad if they're not looking to employ 20 people in the first two years. Um, they're, they're doing great things. Uh, and, and they're usually the most active parts of the community. Yeah. Uh, and they're the ones who are willing to give the most support and advice, which, you know, if you happen to have um, three pretty niche skill sets around you when you're looking to uh, yeah. start to develop what your marketing strategy is or, or how you're going to raise, then, uh, yeah, that, that, that's worth more than us being able to have yeah. um, a room full of pool tables, so that would be nice. Um, the other thing, you know, it's, it's about making the time to organize those things. Yeah. It sounds stupid, but putting a Facebook post up saying, who fancies coming to the pub this Friday? Um, <laughs> you've just got to find the time in the week to think, oh, now's the time when it's reasonable to go on Facebook for yeah. five minutes. Um, but actually, you know, again, looking across Europe, um, the UK is well behind France and Spain. Uh, in terms of the interest in co-working. I think London is the leading city in the world for co-working spaces with over 70, I think, or something like that. Um, but Barcelona certainly isn't mm -hmm. far behind. Um, and uh, outside London, uh, yeah, Londinium as a nation, I suppose, um, it's, a different, it's a different market, it's a different mm -hmm. economy. So, okay. um, and there are, even in talking about spaces in Wales, um, the Alacrity Foundation could be classed as a space which is supporting entrepreneurship and activities, but it's not seen as a co-working space. It's not seen yeah. as, a, as yeah. an open space. So, um, yeah, there's a lot going on maybe under the surface. Sorensen yeah. Foundation, they're creating great things as well. So, Okay. And, uh, David, you, 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 you talked in some ways about the, the kind of service offering to, to, to those kind of businesses. Um, uh, what, 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 what's the ideal mix? What would you like to be able to deliver? Yeah, for us, it's all about connections and making the, uh, in innovation speak, the ecosystem uh, dense so that you have all the opportunity you need to meet with and connect with the people who are going to buy your product, mm. who you're going to work with, um, who you're going to socialise with. And I, I do take up uh, Paul's point about fun. You know, as entrepreneurs, we all know it's a kind of <laughs> pretty stressful career path. And uh, fun's important to keep you sane. And uh, co-working is a great way of, of keeping yourself sane, keeping yourself centred. But it's not everything, um, especially in the kind of rural uh, environment that uh, we find ourselves in. Um, it's sometimes difficult for people out in the sticks to connect with other people. And uh, we spend a lot of time going to visit people and making sure they're tied in with the network, tied in with the, uh, the local co-working spaces, um, who uh, in general are very keen to reach out to, to people out there, um, maybe one person, maybe two people in their businesses. But for us, it's all about connections. Uh, funding's great, mm. you know, we all like funding, but the most wonderful thing is customers. 
Um, and for an entrepreneur to have customers is fantastic, and that's what we're about. Okay. And so, um, so cl clearly, I guess, in, in any innovation ecosystem, there's a whole series of things that uh, need to come together, and you know, finance has been mentioned, infrastructure was talked about, we're talking about space here. Um, you know, you need the right kind of skills, you, you need access to customers. How, um, uh, Gareth, how, how are you helping the businesses to, to, to kind of access all of those elements? Because uh, clearly the provision of space and table tennis is nice uh, and should be encouraged, but actually they need, they need all of those other things. The, the main thing that we found is that they need to they need access to those things, but they don't need to know they've got access to those things. So they yeah. need to know it's there when they need it. Um, they need to know their broadband will always work. They need to know their phones will always work. They need to know that if they don't want to take that call, someone on reception will take that call. So that if they're in the zone, if they're focused on what they're working on at that moment, that is the most important thing. I think, um, I, how many people in the room run their own businesses? Yeah, good. <laughs> um, so, as, and how many started as sole founders? Yeah, so that, that, that time that you have, <laughs> um, which is uh, of incredible importance and incredibly limited, um, needs to be entirely focused on, on the mm -hmm. task at hand. Um, and that's essentially what we try to do is, yeah. I don't like the phrases like protecting them and you know, we don't want it to be too mollycoddling. If they don't have that grit and resilience to really make it, then they won't make it, whether they're in a co-working space or a shared space or an incubator or not. Um, but in order to just be able to focus and not have to worry about yeah. uh, if you're working from home, making sure the washing's done or making sure the kids are picked up or making sure that um, the washing machine isn't going up when you're on the phone to a client. Yeah, um, yeah it, it's just being free to get on with it. Uh, okay. And, and Paul, what about, um, so clearly the, the, there's, there's a network of service providers out there to support startups, you know, uh, uh, legal advice, accountancy, finance, and so on. How, what, what measures do you take to kind of draw draw that network in to, to, to work with the businesses? Um, <clears throat> it's quite good to see so many entrepreneurs here. Um, I, just one question I want to ask: um, How many have actually got a lease at the moment that they're operating? You know that they. Uh, so okay. So how many people are working from home? Okay. Yeah. Um, well, just to answer your question, mm. um, yeah, we we work closely with uh, lots of well, events. Is 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 the one? Is is the thing? You know, events yeah. is like our lifeblood, really. And getting people to come along to events means that that kind of stuff, which you're talking about, you know, integrating with um, uh, service providers, uh, tends to happen very naturally at events. It's much better, I find, you know, that you just bump into somebody that happens to run an accountancy and you just talk to them about what your, yeah. um, what your issues are. Um, and Wales is a very, <coughs> very small pool of, of professionals. Yeah. You know, in, in, if you, when you compare it to somewhere like London or Bristol or, you know, the whole of Wales is actually, I mean, yeah. I've bumped into the same faces all the time in the last year. Um, and... You know, getting on first name terms a lot of the time with with a lot of the service providers yeah. is actually brilliant mm. because uh, you know, and co working spaces really affect that. You know, they, they, when yeah. you have, when you have an event in the space, everyone sort of clubs in. You know, comes along mm. to the event, gets stocked full of pizza and beer, yeah. and you know, and um, it's very relaxed and it's much less formal, I think, um, and much more open and transparent. And what the value of that is is that. Um, of course, we're all trying to sell something to somebody, um, but I think when you go to an event or you're going to, uh, you know, whether you're, you're a member of Tech Hub and, and you're there and somebody's coming to the event, it's, it's, you're much more transparent and you can be much more open. It's less, less of a sales pitch. Um, so you can actually, for service providers, they can come in and really build relationships with, with uh, companies that in three years' time <coughs> might be million pound companies. Um, so for them, that's you know to be first name terms of the person who's running that company means that you've already broken through a lot of the sales rubbish that you have to do in order to get those relationships going. Mm -hmm. So for service providers, it works really, really well. You know the whole the whole model works really, really well. Uh, it's, it's very everyone's very accessible, and that's you know part of the whole co-working uh, ethos, really. Okay, so so kind of quite an unstructured um, approach in some ways, but just creating the opportunity. So uh, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah okay. I mean, it's, it, what, what happens, what tends to happen is, you know, you will get introduced to people because mm. they know that you need something. Yeah. Yeah. So rather than you being sort of, uh, you ringing up um, a solicitor or ringing up, uh, uh, you know, yeah. an insurance company, it'll be that somebody will say, oh, have you spoken to, he's a good guy or he's, uh, you know, she, she's, she's a good girl, you know, it's like that. You go and speak to them, and it'll happen across a room rather than, yeah. you know, you having to do the formal, you know, the formal thing of arranging a meeting and all that stuff, okay. you know. Uh, it's, it just works so well. It works really well in London. It works really well in, in, in places like that because, in fact, most recruitment, <laughs> sadly, most recruitment con uh, consultants, you know, who are trying to recruit uh, IT companies um, are now looking at events, you know, like tech events yeah. as, a, as a real yeah. way of getting their claws into you. Okay. Yeah. And, and David, can you, can, you, can you answer the question? But also, can you, um, you, you've talked a little bit about um, how you broker that link into potential clients, because I think that's something the other guys haven't touched on so much. Be, be interested in how you facilitate that and make it happen. Yeah, um, I think, before I do that, maybe I can just uh, say something about the uh, uh, intellectual property, um, which is, hugely important and largely misunderstood. Um, we realized that for a lot of innovators, in intellectual property was a big stumbling block. Um, and we found a lot of the funding we were giving out to people went on intellectual property lawyers and patent agents. Um, and often you didn't really need to do that. And it's often very inappropriate to um, uh, spend a lot of money on patents as a, as a small business. Um, and we uh, did some work with the IPO, the Intellectual Property Office in Newport, um, and uh, coincidentally they were developing a course for intellectual property advisors, um, which we helped them with. Um, and so we provide a sort of pre-patent service to try and just get your ducks in a row and make sure that you're going for the right type of intellectual property before we introduce you into um, mm. people like patent agents. And I think that's a very yeah. useful service that any, um, any sort of innovation group can offer because uh, we up here don't have a, um, a commercial edge. We're all not-for-profit. Um, so we can advise you um, without any um, without any edge in that, in that, and that's something really useful. Um, going back to your point about how we connect, um, we think open innovation is a wonderful model, um, and over the years um, we've developed our own flavour of uh, open innovation service. Um, open innovation is great, where we but. It's got to be safe. Uh, it's great collaborating with a lot of people in a room and everyone gets very excited. But your intellectual property is your intellectual property and you must make sure that's safe. So we've designed a service where we can put you in contact as a small businesses with larger businesses um, uh, in a structured and step-by-step -step way, and making sure that the non-disclosure agreements are all signed, and we do all that for you. So all you have to do is turn up and pitch your idea. Um, and I think that's a very powerful model, because what small businesses need is sales, and what large businesses need is innovation. It's large businesses just cannot innovate. Uh, I had, did a wonderful connection like this once between one of the big defense firms and a small games company. And they invented something there in the room. Um, it was all to do with, with games and vehicles. Uh, the big company went off into a corner and, and talked about how they might um, develop a project, who they, who they need to pull in to make it happen, what kind of senior management and project managers. And while they were doing this, the games company had written the software and was trialing it in their, in their game. They'd done it. And it's just some, I think it's difficult sometimes for small business to realize how bad large companies are at innovating. And when we connect people in, uh, the magic happens and the, the large company is so grateful. All you need to do is get in front of these guys. Mm. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll try and bring the audience in a little now. Um, well, first of all, let me ask a question. So, 
Um, how many people think there is um, a sufficient supply of co-working space uh, in Wales? So a show of hands, how many do think that? Okay, so maybe six or seven. How many do not think there's a sufficient supply of co-working space? Okay, so that gets the, uh, gets the majority. And how many don't care? Uh, okay, uh, none. Um, okay, so uh, let's, uh, let's, let's have a show of hands for any, uh, any questions that you have there. So uh, there's one here at the front, if we could. So if you could just, uh, the mic's coming in, if you could just say uh, na name and your organisation, that would, that would My help. My name is Esco, I'm from the Satori Lab. Uh, I think it's in, important to make a distinction when we're talking about entrepreneurial mm. ecosystems that there are broadly two categories of companies emerging. Some of them conform to the old industrial notions of organisations, like retail businesses, manufacturing. Mm. And a lot of the new, I would argue, more interesting ones don't, because they are born of ideas and principles around organisation yeah. that didn't exist. So as a young startup in Cardiff, we have singularly failed to get any benefit from any of the traditional government support services. Everything that we have learned that has been of use has been through people like mm. these, so there's, a, there's actually a split right in the middle of the, the, the panel between what I see as the old world and the new world. Um, and I think that we need to be mindful of that. So if the Welsh government, for example, wants to invest in this new type of entrepreneurial ecosystem, it's probably better placed to give these guys the money directly rather than try to emulate the, 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 the previous style of support services to this new model. Mm. And we're seeing really worrying things coming out. For example, videos coming out of the Welsh government that purports to talk about how do you do innovation and are just giving plain wrong definitions of innovation, right? So it, 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 it's actually exposing that you don't know how to do this. Really? So I just want to make that point that we need a more granular discussion about what kind of businesses that are emerging in mm. the ecosystem and what kind of support and facilities yeah. they need. Yeah, okay. So, well, if I can just make a couple of comments in response. So I think what's interesting is that, um, and, and it's not always uh, clear to outsiders that this happens, but government does fund um, some initiatives uh, on, 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 across the way. Um, you know, go government does provide support for innovation. Some companies it works for, others it, it doesn't. Government creates environments like this to help some of this dynamic happen. So it, it, depend, it depends on the perspective, and I think it works for some, but, but, but not all. Um, was there a question behind the point, or was it really an observation? I, I'd just like to see that granularity in the discussion. Well, yeah. Just talking about yeah. Yeah, a particular area that we'd like to, like to get some views from the panel on? Uh, I'm sure Gareth has got something <laughs> interesting to say about this. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure about interesting, Gareth. but... Go for it. Uh, well, uh, Wales is a very strange place in that we're the only nation where we ask for permission from the government before we do anything uh, in the startup world. And I think we had an interesting meeting with um, the head of Inward Investment at San Francisco's mayor's office. And... Um, we were talking about the kind of introductions he can make into businesses and it was almost, well, I don't really know if I, can, if I can do that, but you ask someone in the government and you know, they've got access to all of these businesses and it's almost, it's almost the relationship is uh, it's too familiar in Wales. Uh, we know who the key players are, the key individuals are within innovation, within entrepreneurship, um, and that shouldn't be the case. We should be just getting on with it, I think. I think there, it, there are challenges around how uh, the public funding is made available to projects to make it happen, but again, it's too slow and it's too cumbersome for it to enable that kind of activity, um, because as you know from the activities you're involved with, you don't know what the outcomes will be when you first get started. You just know there'll be something beautiful that's created. The government doesn't and arguably shouldn't um, be in that space, but the reason why government is involved so much is because we have a lack of inherent wealth in a lot of key areas in Wales. And, you know, we're talking about Cardiff and Swansea um, as being represented essentially, as, you know, I see Caffili as being a big part of the Cardiff capital region. I know that Caffili Canterbury Council agree with that as well. Um, I'm a North Walian uh, and uh, <laughs> one of the gog in the... Oh, no, there we are. Right, now let's take over. Um, you know, there's, there's, um, there's a whole different challenge uh, in North Wales than, than there is down in the south, and, and uh, should that be government-led or should that be community-led? And how do you get the community to, to give a toss, really? 
Yeah, um, I don't really care uh, is the answer to, I don't know if it was a question, but the problem is not really about um, old or new or this or that. It's to do with risk. It comes down, to, boils down to risk. Um, it would be great to have uh, a country chock full of entrepreneurs that are cutting it by their own and, and doing everything by themselves. We don't have enough money. We don't have enough people in Wales to actually have our own startup ecosystem. We have to be global. We have to compete globally. We have to be, you know, create cities of global significance. Um, I find the kind of inward discussion about where the money comes from irrelevant. It's, it's irrelevant. You know, to me, it doesn't matter whether it comes from the government or it comes from a big organization. You know, that, that's, I think we get hung up too much on government, state, all this. We've got an absolutely fantastic opportunity in, 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 in Wales right now, right now. I mean, we've got oodles of European money f sloshing about. Um, you know, we've got a government that doesn't quite know what to do with it, but is doing really good things. You know, it is doing the best that it can because you've, quite rightly, you know, you, you, you've got people who are facing... Uh, innovation uh, and products that are accelerating at such a fast pace that not even people who are in the industry can keep up with what's, with what's happening. So then to ask a government to innovate at the same speed is just not going to happen. But what they can do is they can be more flexible. And they have been. You know, they've, they've been flexible with, with you guys. Um, you know, they've been great with us. And what it comes down to is, is it really comes down to us wanting to take risks, you know, as entrepreneurs, as business owners, we, we, don't want, we don't really want to put our houses on the line. We don't really want to put our, you know, our, our kids through uh, not seeing their, you know, their dad for, for weeks on end because you're working till, you know, but we do it. You know, we, we do it and we, we, we take those risks and we do those things. And if we've got somebody to back us up that's got a load of money that, is otherwise going to get spent on building a new road, then great, you know, fantastic. Um, but it, what, it comes down to me, ambition, and, you know, we, we are, as a nation, a uh, nation of overachievers. Um, you know, we overachieve in, in, in sports, we overachieve in, in lots of areas. We've got some absolutely fantastic technology um, legacy and, and pedigree here. And instead of looking inward and saying, what are we spending the money on? Why don't we just look outward and say, you know, we've got now got, for the first time in perhaps, I don't know, ever, um, an international level playing field where we could start a company that could, be, could become the same size as Facebook or Google. You know, that could become an absolute cash cow for the economy. We've got that potential. Mm. But, and I would rather us focus on building stuff like that and just being, you know, people that just take opportunities. We're absolutely brilliant at, you know, as Welsh people, we're brilliant at creating communities. We're very good at creating communities. Um, we're perhaps not the best at, you know, shouting about our, you know, our own successes. We're not, we're not, we're not American, you know. So <laughs> the, the next best thing is, is to look at communities as the places where these companies, these in, you know, these, these initiatives, whether they be profit or non-profit, are started. And that's what, what we should be focusing on, not on this question about government versus everything else. Okay. Thank you, Paul. Uh, I'm going to, David, if you could pause there, I'm going to move the discussion on a little bit, if I may. Um, so next question uh, over here, please, if we could. Andy Carr, I'm head of supply chain at FreeSat. Um, Wales is really special. It's got a great community, a great sense of social community about it. How do we encourage more people in those communities to take those first steps and start businesses? Because for every one Google, you need a thousand large companies and you need 10,000 small companies. Yeah, David, well, I, could I you... I can uh, tell you how we do it. Yep. Um, a lot of legwork. Um, we go and see people and offer people funding um, to think about the very first 
stage of their idea. Um, and often that, the first question you need to ask is, is it new? Has anyone done that before? Um, and you know, if, you, if you read the literature about um, creativity and, and uh, how that is converted into, into a business, um, if you don't answer that question pretty quickly, then you don't have a business. So we help people. We go and do one-to-one -one interviews with as many people as possible. And I think um, there's very little substitute for doing that. It's a very expensive um, uh, thing to try and do. Um, and the government does do some of it. But I think naturally for government, they, they find it more, in, more useful to deal, deal with large companies um, through the catapult centres and Innovate UK. And it's, it's, it's more hard work to deal with individuals um, in terms of manpower. But uh, that's, as we know, where the growth comes from. It's, it's small companies, individuals, people working, co-working centres, that's where the growth comes from. The, so, the, 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 the question is about how we, how we find them, I think, is the, is the key thing. So yeah. okay, we're, well, we're we saying have, it's difficult. We have some prior... Uh, we look at the patent database. We look at... Um, uh, we go to events. Um, we uh, at, just go and see an awful lot of people mm. um, and make uh, people aware that we exist and we're there to help. And uh, Gareth, where do, you, where do you find them? I think I'd, I'd, um, I'd reframe it a bit as well. I don't know if anyone saw within the development bank proposals about this idea for a lottery. Did anyone see that? Where essentially everyone submits a business plan and once a month they pull one out of the hat and that's the one that receives £100,000. Um, and a lot of people, uh, well, Sean Barry didn't like it, but everyone else kind of thought, well, hang on a minute, how much do they waste at the minute uh, on, on the grant process? And actually to get access to these business plans and then be able to connect them with alternative sources of finance, I thought it was quite a sweet idea. Um, it will never happen. But, um, but that, that's quite a nice way to actually see where that, where that motivation or that inspiration is. The, I think the biggest problem, Andy, is that um, depending on where you are and what communities you have access to, uh, if you're in a, in a, in a pub in, in Blind Avenue and you say, I've got an idea, it's a search engine and uh, we're going to do this and this and this, and the person sat next to you says, get real. It dies there. I think there are a lot of people who don't have the ambition or the, the right support network around them that, that give them the belief at that early stage. Or, you know, we're not even talking about credible advice and credible insight. We're just talking about the belief to actually start pursuing it. And I think that's where true entrepreneurs have a, a different kind of drive and a different kind of grit, I suppose. And Paul, how do we find them? Because I think the, 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 the kind of dangle, the carrot of finance is, is one way. But How do you find them? Well, um, it comes down to a matter of um, uh, uh, culture. Um, and they're out there. Um, in fact, all the people here have, uh, well, not all the people, all the people who stuck their hands up um, were, you know, entrepreneurs starting out at one point. Um, I think if you... You have to look at communities, not particularly at uh, sets of skills, um, because there are varied sets of skills used to bring a product or a company to market. Um, but you have to have somebody with a crazy idea to do it in the first place. Often, to do something that is either, you know, if you're talking about a global product, right, so you're talking about something that is globally unique. And I'm not talking about starting a fitness company or, or something like that. I'm talking about, you know, entrepreneurs that are that kind of come along are going to change things and make big, you know, these massive companies. Um, well, they have to have absolutely crazy ideas. They have to be belligerent. They have to, have, um, to take it on a bit of a tangent. My, my missus read me an article this morning uh, before I left all about um, how to control your strong-willed child, right? And uh, it was all about, basically, if you... Um, you know, the strong will of a child is is basically all all the qualities like you know that you need in an entrepreneur, right? So they just don't listen. They're a pain in the ass. Um, you know, they they do what they want to do regardless of what um, what you know what what you tell them to do, and it can be really frustrating, really frustrating as a parent when you want them to just do that thing, yeah, and they're just not you know they, what they're going to do is they're going to learn by themselves. 
And it's fostering that culture. I mean, as a parent, because what you end up with is you end up with somebody that can stand on their own two feet, right? And can challenge the status quo. <coughs> Sorry. So in order to find those people, you need to foster that culture of being able to fail. So this is, you know, this is what it comes down to, right? So it's been able to make mistakes. You know, um, we've got companies that have failed three or four times and pivoted in, in, mm. in Tech Hub. And when we, when we have new people come into the space, you know, it's, very, it's a very relaxed atmosphere. Um, so that encourages them. Like we, I had a guy come in two weeks ago um, and he's been working for a, a big data company in, in SA1. And uh, he, 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 he t we were at an event and he told me about this app and it sounded awful. You know, it sounded absolutely terrible. Uh, it was some globe thing, right? It's like, what? And, um, and then he, he came in and he showed it to me and I was like, I was blown away. You know, I was like, whoa, this is amazing. You know, this is like, wow, this is really cool. We could do loads of, you know. And it's like having that thing where I don't know how it would make money. I don't know what, I don't even know if it'd be a good idea in, you know, if someone else has done it. But it's, <clears throat> it's giving everybody um, regardless of age, because I think we tend to get hung up on young entrepreneurs, but actually a lot of the most successful entrepreneurs are probably the age demographic of this room, you know, uh, people who've been there and done it a bit and, you know, I've got a bit of life experience. So it's really not about sort of find, uh, discovering, entre you know, like this, there's this mi mine shaft of entrepreneurs you suddenly sort of open up and then they spring out of the ground, you know, we are those entrepreneurs. We are the people that would go into our, you know, our co-working spaces and, and for one day a week and try and work on some crazy-ass product that, that sounds awful and probably will never go anywhere. But, you know, that's, that's where it comes from for me. Okay. Um, I think we've probably got time for one more question. I'll know we're out of time, I think. So, um, uh, well, thanks for everybody who came along. Thanks for the questions. Uh, thanks to our panel members and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Well done.